20-year-old Sophie Sergi lived in Pitkus Point, Alaska in 1993. On April 25th, she went to visit a friend of hers at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. The last time Sophie was seen was when she left her group of friends to smoke a cigarette outside. The next morning, a janitor found Sophie's body in a dormitory bathtub. She had been stabbed multiple times, shot in the back of the head, and also indecently assaulted. Investigators collected evidence from the crime scene, including male DNA from Sophie's body. They also interviewed Sophie's friends and other people that either lived in the dorm or studied at the university that might know something. Unfortunately, investigators were not able to find a substantial lead that would help them find the perpetrator. The case then went cold. In 2019, investigators decided to take another look at the case. This time, they had more advanced DNA technology to aid them. Investigators took the DNA of the unknown man that was collected from Sophie's body and submitted it into a public DNA database. They were then able to find a relative of the suspect. They believed it was his aunt that they found. She had uploaded a sample to a commercial online genealogy database. The man who they believed was responsible is 47-year-old Stephen Downs. Still, in 2019, investigators executed a search warrant at his home in Auburn, Maine. They collected a DNA sample from him. This DNA sample matched the one collected from the crime scene back in 1993. He was then promptly arrested. Downs' trial began in January of 2022. During the trial, jurors heard from people who were at the dorm on the night of the crime, forensic experts and law enforcement. We learned that Downs was a freshman at the university in 1993 and lived in the dorm where Sophie's life was taken. Downs' friend and then roommate testified that he owned guns and a large hunting knife, including a 22 caliber pistol. An expert testified that Sophie was shot with a 22 caliber bullet. Downs' did not testify at the trial, but jurors heard a recording of his conversation with investigators. He denied knowing Sophie and keeping a gun in his dorm room. In the recording, he also told police that he was with his then girlfriend all evening when the crime took place. The girlfriend testified during the trial that Downs had left the room several times that evening. During closing statements, Prosecutor Jenna Gernstein encouraged jurors to remember that Downs' DNA was found at the scene and that the alternative suspects raised by the defense had been ruled out because their own DNA did not match any found at the scene. The jury deliberated for days before reaching a verdict on February 8, 2022. Downs was found guilty of both charges against him. Jenna Gerdstein said, We are grateful that Stephen Downs was held accountable for his actions after almost 30 years and hope that Sophie's family and the Fairbanks community as a whole are able to obtain some closure in light of this verdict. Downs' attorney, James Halanik, said that Downs and his team of defense lawyers were disappointed by the verdict and that there would likely be an appeal. It was a very emotional and difficult case, he said. Obviously, we continue to believe in the innocence of our client, but we also respect the process and we respect the jury's verdict. Howanik said questions about the genetic genealogy will likely be erased on appeal. The science is relatively new and Downs is the first man in Alaska to stand trial for a charge that resulted from genetic genealogy. The science is controversial when used by law enforcement because it could infringe on constitutional rights, Howanik said. A lot of people across the country are watching this case and wondering whether it's going to go up to the Supreme Court, and this could be the opportunity to litigate that, he said, so we'll see. Downs is being held without bail at the Fairbanks Correctional Center and is scheduled to be sentenced in September. He faces a maximum prison sentence of 129 years. Nine-year-old Marie Chivarella lived with her family in Hazleton, Pennsylvania in 1964. On March 18th, Maurice left her Hazleton home early to deliver canned goods to a nun before attending class at St. Joseph's Parochial School. Sometime during her half-mile walk, Maurice disappeared. When she was marked absent from school and did not return home for lunch like she normally would, her family called the police to report her missing. That afternoon, Maurice's body was discovered two miles away from her house in a strip mining pit near the Hazleton Municipal Airport. 
Her wrists and ankles were bound by her own shoelaces and her scarf was stuffed in her mouth. She had been indecently assaulted and strangled. Investigators collected DNA belonging to an unknown man from the crime scene. It was collected so that it could be used later. In 2007, investigators used the DNA sample to create a DNA profile of the suspect. It was submitted into the combined DNA index system, but no matches could be made unfortunately. Investigators did not give up and every month they would compare the DNA profile to the new entries in the database. In 2019, their persistence finally matched a distant relative of the suspect. From 2019 to 2021, authorities conducted numerous interviews and collected DNA samples from this family. The samples helped narrow in on four suspects, but one of them caught investigators' attention because of his criminal history. That person was James Paul Forte. He was not part of the initial investigation in 1964. They noticed that he had passed away in 1980 due to natural causes at the age of 38. With the assistance of the Luzerne County District's Attorney's Office, investigators exhumed Forte's body to obtain his DNA sample. After some more DNA testing, they were able to confirm in February of 2022, he was responsible for taking Maurice's life. The chance of another person having this same profile is 1 in 480 septillion. Police stated Forte was arrested in Hazleton back in 1974 on similar charges with a different victim. He was later arrested in 1978 for reckless endangerment and harassment. Police said it may not have been the only crime Forte committed and asked anyone with information to come forward. Maurice Chivarella's case was the oldest cold case in Pennsylvania and the fourth oldest case in America to be solved with genetic genealogy, authorities said. Maurice's brother, Ronald Chivarella, attended the press conference and had this to say. Now that we know the individual, it gives us a sense of closure. Not full closure, we'll never have that, but a sense of closure that we know the individual that did it, and that the individual isn't out committing the same crime, and hurting other young girls like Maurice. Forte lived six or seven blocks away from the Chivarellas. Authorities stated relatives did not know Forte and believed the attack was random. Today, Maurice and Chivarella would be 67 years old. 30-year-old Roxanne Leah Wood lived in Barron County, Michigan with her husband Terry Wood. On February 20th, 1987, the two of them went bowling. They had gone with two separate cars and left the bowling alley separately again. Roxanne was the first one to leave and go home. When Terry arrived home later, he found Roxanne's body. She was on the floor of their kitchen. Her throat had been slit. DNA belonging to the suspect was collected at the crime scene. Terry became a suspect, but investigators could not find any evidence that he was involved in any way. The DNA found at the crime scene that belonged to the suspect was not his, but DNA technology was not advanced enough to determine who it belonged to then. In 2001, the Michigan State Police 5th District Cold Case Team worked on the case for more than a year, reviewing 3,347 pages of information and going through evidence. Unfortunately, their hard work did not lead them to a suspect and the case went cold again. Investigators then reopened the case in 2020. In February of 2021, investigators received a tip from a credible and reliable source that 67-year-old Patrick Wayne Gilham should be looked into as a suspect. Investigators followed him around. He lived in South Bend, Indiana. In June of 2021, they collected a cigarette butt with Gilham's DNA on it. State police sent the cigarette to their forensic lab in Grand Rapids, where it came back as a match to the unknown DNA found at the crime scene. Police officers then brought Gillum in to be interviewed. He denied going to Michigan other than for work. He said he only knew two people named Roxanne, but neither matched Roxanne Wood's description. Gillum was then shown a photo of Roxanne. He said he did not know her at all. When investigators told Gillum what had happened to Roxanne, his demeanor quickly changed. He began to breathe rapidly and his hands shook as he was holding them up. He then said he needed to talk to a lawyer and the interview was terminated. On February 17, 2022, Gilham was arrested in connection to the case at his home on East Bowman Street. An old lady who is the neighbor of Gilham said he shoveled her sidewalk after the most recent snowstorm without being asked. She offered to pay him but he declined. 
The lady is surprised, but said it could have been an accident what he did so many years ago. I personally would like to know how someone accidentally breaks into a home, slits someone's throat, and assault them. Gilham's bond is set at 500000 If he posts it, he must wear a tracker and stay in a residence in Michigan. He'll appear in court for a preliminary examination. Lieutenant Chuck Christensen said, There's relief that we have an individual arrested for this, but I can tell you that there's a lot of investigative work that will continue from this point. Christensen also said that he spoke with Roxanne's husband Terry and her family last night. He was happy and thankful that this breakthrough has been made. Additionally, he expressed relief. After this Sunday, it will be 35 years since this had happened. He's processing that as well as the rest of her family. Twenty-year-old Mary Jane Thompson lived in Dallas, Texas in 1984. She had previously lived in Houston and Los Angeles, but decided to move to Dallas in 1983. Mary worked at a florist shop and also a restaurant. She had dreamed of becoming a model. Mary was last seen taking a bus to a medical clinic on February 11, 1984. Two days later, her body was found behind a warehouse in Dallas. She had been strangled by her own leg warmers and also assaulted. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the culprit from the scene for it to be used later. In 2009, a DNA profile was created for the suspect, but it did not match anyone in the database and the case went cold. In 2018, Dallas police decided to reopen the case. This time, DNA was much more advanced and they worked with a team from the district attorney's office and the FBI. The DNA profile of the suspect was submitted to the public DNA databases. Then finally, in February of 2021, investigators determined that 60-year-old Edward Morgan's DNA matched the DNA collected at the crime scene back in 1984. Morgan was arrested and is currently being held at the Dallas County Jail. Dallas County Assistant District Attorney Leighton Diatoni said, Working together, we continue to solve the most difficult cold cases that Dallas has ever seen. I look forward to working with all our local law enforcement agencies to utilize the advancements in forensic testing techniques to identify, arrest, and prosecute the most dangerous predators hiding among us. We never ever forget about these cases, our victims, and their families. After the arrest, Mary's sister, Selena Tomasello, posted several messages and a montage of family photos on Facebook. Missing you, sis. On Friday, when I got a call I've been waiting 38 years for. He will be in jail for the rest of his life. He is no longer free as a bird. I know you are looking down. Seventy-nine-year-old Viola Hagencord lived alone in an apartment in Anaheim, California in 1980. On February 18, 1980, a neighbor of Viola became concerned about her whereabouts. Viola was often seen walking around the apartment complex, but she hadn't been seen for two days. The neighbor stepped inside Viola's unit and found her lifeless body. She had been assaulted and strangled. Over the years, detectives attempted to solve the case, pursuing new leads or bits of evidence, but failed to identify a suspect and the case went cold. In September of 2020, the case was reopened. This time, investigators turned to genetic genealogy, which has been used to solve hundreds of cases across the U.S. Investigators used DNA found on Viola and compared it with genetic profiles on genealogy databases. This led investigators to 64-year-old Andre William LaPere. He was arrested on April 28, 2021 at his home in Alamogordo, New Mexico in connection to the case. He is being held without bail at a Notaro County Jail. It is not believed that Andre and Viola knew each other. Viola's family had this to say in a statement. Our grandmother, Viola, was a beautiful, happy soul and did not deserve being violated in her final years of life. We are so grateful for the Anaheim Police Department never giving up after 41 years, and that is our message. Never, never give up. LaPere was in his 20s at the time of the crime and lived close to Viola in Anaheim, California. Sometime in the 1990s, he moved east. He split his time between Arizona and New Mexico. LaPere worked as a plumber and a truck driver. He married twice and had two children. 
investigators had not established a motive for the crime. In February of 2022, LaPere was convicted for the crime. He will be sentenced on May 13th. 27-year-old Cynthia Rogers lived in Prince George's County in 1989. She was a biologist and was working on research on Parkinson's disease at the National Institutes of Health. On January 22, 1989, Cynthia left her house to go to the market and purchase items for soup. Later, when Cynthia's family members tried to contact her and failed to reach her, they called the police to report her missing. Five days after she was last seen, Cynthia's body was found on a dirt path littered with trash in the Forestville, Maryland area. Police knew that locals frequently used the path as a shortcut to the store. Cynthia had multiple blunt force injuries to her upper body and head. She had been strangled. After the autopsy was done, it was determined that she had been assaulted as well. The DNA belonging to the man who committed this crime was taken from her body and stored so it could be used later when DNA was more advanced. In 2018, Detective Bernie Nelson started working on the case. The DNA collected from the crime scene was then used to rule out several suspects. At the time, however, it wasn't a strong enough sample to run through the federal database. The profile that the FBI was able to develop from the sample wasn't strong enough to meet the standards to enter into the database, said Nelson. But it is something we can work with if given the name of someone who we can approach and obtain their DNA and compare it directly to the sample. More recently, with DNA technology that's even more advanced, investigators could enter the DNA sample from the suspect into the FBI database. It matched to James Clinton Cole. Cole had several charges filed against him. This includes a misdemeanor assault in 1984 and a charge of destruction of property just days before Cynthia's disappearance. When interviewed, Cole denied ever knowing or meeting Cynthia 33 years ago. It has not yet been indicated when Cole is scheduled to appear before a judge in the case. He is currently incarcerated at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland for an unrelated crime. Cole is 64 years old and would have been 32 at the time of the crime was committed. It's not believed that he and Cynthia knew each other. Cynthia's brother, Philip Rogers, had this to say. The burden has been lifted to a certain point. There will never be total healing because of the incident altogether but we have some relief. Cynthia's mother, Rosia Rogers, said, This makes us feel better. My heart is feeling lighter. Eighteen-year-old Anita Knudsen lived in Minot, North Dakota in 2007. She was described as a tenacious, kind, and compassionate young woman. She had just completed her first year at Minot State University, where she was studying elementary education. She was working two jobs to pay for school and was living in an off-campus apartment with her roommate, Nicole Rice. Anita's mother, Sharon Knutson, last spoke to Anita on Friday, June 1, 2007. The two were in touch daily. When Anita didn't answer her phone for several days, Sharon asked her husband, Gordon, to drive from their home in Butte, North Dakota, to Anita's apartment. Gordon attempted to enter the apartment, but it was locked. He then found the landlady and the maintenance worker and asked for help. The maintenance man had recalled seeing a window screen, removed and sliced out of Anita's apartment. Gordon went to look for the screen and realized it was from Anita's bedroom window. He looked inside and saw his daughter on her bed. He touched her through the window to wake her up, but when he felt how cold her skin was, he knew she was not alive anymore. Gordon then called 911 to report what he had just seen. Officers arrived at 5.12 p.m. They removed a large house coat that was on top of her body. It was clear to them that she had been stabbed numerous times. Investigators found a small pocket knife with dried blood on the edge of Anita's bed. Her laptop, cell phone, purse, and digital camera were all in her bedroom. This indicated that robbery was not the motive for the crime. There were no signs that anyone had entered through Anita's bedroom window, where the screen had been taken out. Investigators also determined that the screen was cut after the crime was committed. Sergeant David Goodman from the Minot Police Department said, I believe the purpose would be to mislead law enforcement, to try and show that this is possibly an entry point. Police questioned Anita's friends, neighbors, and construction workers who were on a job nearby. They also found traces of DNA on the pocket knife and took samples from the people they interviewed. 
Police then spoke to Anita's roommate, Nicole Rice. Rice said that she was with her family all weekend. Investigators suspected that something was off with Rice's story. Statements given by Rice and her parents were allegedly inconsistent and contradictory. Several of Anita's friends told police that Anita and Rice often fought. They described Rice as hot-tempered and reactionary. Anita's mother, Sharon, agreed and said Anita was scared of her. She added that Rice allegedly sent Anita threatening messages. Anita planned to move out. Minot Police Chief John Klung said that Rice is a suspect. He received tips about Rice and they were following all leads, but they did not have enough evidence to arrest her. Thus, the case went cold for many years. This year, in 2022, the Minot Police Department began re-interviewing suspects and witnesses. They also partnered with a true crime show called Cold Justice. The program provides additional support and expertise for investigators to help solve the case. During the renewed effort, investigators learned that Rice was dating a man for a few months in 2008 and 2009. According to the man, Rice got belligerently drunk one evening. Rice then told the man that she took Anita's life. The man later tried to ask Rice about the confession when she was sober, but she allegedly rebuffed the questions in anger. On the 16th of March, 2022, Rice was arrested at the Minot Air Force Base, where she worked as a civilian. She was taken to Ward County Jail and released the next day on a $120,000 bond. Rice is due back in court on April 21st, according to court records. Minot Police Chief John Klung did not want to provide more details in the evidence that pointed to Rice. I think the turning point in this case was just really trying to pull all that information together and put it in an order that made sense. It just took a little bit of refocusing and a lot of paying attention to the finer details. My heart goes out to the family. I wish we could have solved this sooner, but at the same time, I'm glad to say that we have the person responsible in custody. 54-year-old Natalie Shublin lived in Bedford, Massachusetts in 1971. She was married to Raymond Shublin, the president of the Lexington Trust Bank. They had two children, a son and a daughter. On June 10, 1971, when Raymond came home, he found Natalie's lifeless body in their basement. She had been bound and repeatedly stabbed. A gag was found around her neck. It was discovered that her 1969 Chevrolet Impala was missing from their garage. Investigators found the car less than a mile from their home. The car appeared to have been intentionally wiped down to remove fingerprints, but police were able to observe and collect several latent prints from it, including one from the right rear window. Police at the time followed several leads, but unfortunately a suspect could not be identified. Decades passed without an arrest, but in 1999, prosecutors said new FBI fingerprint technology was used. One of the fingerprints on the car matched those of Arthur Lewis Massey. When interviewed by investigators, Massey denied any involvement. Later, he claimed that he was solicited by an organized crime associate to take the life of the wife of a banker and to make the crime look like a break-in. He said that he refused the solicitation. Investigators found no evidence that Raymond Shublin was involved in a plot to end his wife's life. Throughout the years, investigators continued to look into Massey to get enough evidence for an arrest to be made. In 2019, Middlesex County District Attorney Marion Ryan created a cold case unit, trying to solve more cold cases such as Natalie's. Investigators were able to find a woman who said she worked with Massey on a scheme to defraud banks in the 1990s. The woman also provided other critical information. She told investigators that Massey always carried a knife around and bragged that he took someone's life with the knife. That information, along with other facts of the case, was presented to Middlesex County Grand Jury. In March of 2022, he was arrested at his home in Salem, Massachusetts. He was then indicted for the crime and is expected to be arraigned soon, and it will be another step closer to a potential conviction. Bedford Police Chief Ken Fong said in a statement, I'm hopeful that the arrest in this case will provide some closure and sense of justice for Natalie Shublin's family, as well as assurance to all in our community who were shocked by this brutal crime. Massey's daughter Candace said that she had not spoken to her father in 30 years. If it's true, it's absolutely disgusting, she said. We are really sorry for the family. It is shocking to hear this happen two weeks before I was born. 
Massey has a long record of criminal convictions and prison sentences, has assaulted corrections officers, has twice been convicted of escape, and as recently as 2016, was convicted of violating court orders involving harassment and abuse. Twenty-nine-year-old Nona Stamey Cobb lived in Cleveland County, North Carolina. She was a widow. Nona had a three-year-old son named Josh, but lost custody of him because of a drug problem that she had. He went to live with her sister, Vicki Gregory. Nona was last seen on the night of July 6, 1992, at the Welcome Center on Interstate 85 in Cleveland County when she got into a truck being driven by an unidentified male. The next morning at 6.15 a.m. on July 7th, her body was discovered on the northbound side of Interstate 77 in Surrey County, North Carolina. She had been strangled and assaulted. Investigators collected male DNA from her body. It would take three years before investigators identified a suspect. They interviewed Sean Patrick Goble. He was a trucker from Asheboro, North Carolina. Goble denied having any involvement in what happened with Nona. He was, however, later convicted for taking the lives of three other women. He was sentenced to two life sentences plus 14 years in prison. Of course, this made investigators in the Nona case believe that he was the man they were looking for. Investigators took the male DNA they collected from her body and compared it to Goebel's DNA, but it was not a match. He was then ruled out as a suspect. In April of 2021, special agents with the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Cold Case Investigation Unit and investigators with the Sheriff's Office re-examined the physical evidence collected from the crime scene back in 1992. With the help of Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, the founder of Identifiers International, LLC, investigators were able to identify Walter Luther Alexander as a possible suspect by matching his DNA profile to the DNA left on Nona's body. Officers with the Diamond Head Police Department in Mississippi arrested Alexander on the 15th of March, 2022. He is currently being held in the Hancock County Jail as he awaits extradition back to North Carolina to face the charges against him. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation emphasized that the investigation into Alexander remains ongoing and authorities are looking into the possibility that there may be more victims. Twenty-nine-year-old Diane Dawn lived in Santee, California in 1988. She had a two-year-old son named Mark. Diane worked at the San Diego Transit Corporation. On May 2, 1988, when she failed to show up for work, a colleague of hers went to her home. The colleague found Diane's body in her bedroom. She had been fatally stabbed. Diane's son was wandering around the apartment complex. Investigators found DNA of a man under Diane's fingernails, and there was also a hair on her hands that belonged to an unknown man. The evidence was collected and stored, so it could be used later when DNA technology was more advanced. Recently, with the help of genetic genealogy, the technology was advanced enough. Investigators were able to use the hair to create a DNA profile of the suspect. The DNA profile was submitted into the public DNA databases. A cold case team then formed a family tree of the suspect. This process was quite exhaustive as nine family trees were constructed with nearly 1,300 people connected to the suspect, either through blood or marriage. Finally, it led investigators to Warren Robertson. He was a tow truck driver who lived in the same complex as Diane. It is not known if the two of them knew each other, but both were known to be racing enthusiasts and attended stock car races at the El Cajon Speedway. Robertson passed away in a house fire in Indiana in 1990. He was 39 years old. Diane's now-grown son, Mark Bayer, said that he was blown away by how the case was solved. Looking back, some of the struggles you go through is you feel alone because of what you went through. You lost your mother, he said. The answers that my family received is closure, and closure is everything, even after so much time has passed. Diane's younger sister, Victoria Don Minter, said she was grateful that the investigators had solved the case. I didn't think anything was ever going to come of this, she said at the news conference. I thought I myself was going to go to my grave not knowing, as well as my mother and father. Chu Ming Tang lived in San Carlos, California in 1993. 
he immigrated to the U.S. from Taiwan with his wife and children. He opened a mom-and-pop shop called the Devonshire Little Store. On April 26, 1993, police were called when witnesses heard shots being fired in his store. The police found Shu inside. He had been shot. He was rushed to the hospital but did not make it. It was determined that it was a robbery gone wrong. Detectives received information that a woman was seen leaving the store shortly after the shooting. The crime shocked the quiet community of San Carlos and attracted national attention after it was featured on America's Most Wanted. Investigators hoped that useful leads would come in, but that did not happen and the case went cold for some time. In 2018, San Mateo County Sheriff's detectives assigned to the cold case investigations reviewed the case. Then, on March 24, 2022, 61-year-old Reina Elizabeth Hoffman Ramos was arrested in Dewey, Oklahoma in connection to the case. She lived in the same area as Shu back in 1993, but moved to Oklahoma in recent years. Investigators believe that she acted alone. She has a criminal history, according to investigators. She is currently waiting in Washington County Jail, waiting to be taken to California to face the charges against her. San Mateo's County Sheriff's Office Lieutenant Jacob Trickett did not want to elaborate on what exactly led to the arrest, but thanked the advancement in forensic technology. Shu's family has been informed that an arrest has been made in the case. San Mateo County Sheriff Carlos Bolaños said the department thanked Shu's relatives for their support, and he hopes the family will finally get the justice and closure that they deserve. Twenty-year-old Eve Wilkowitz lived in Long Island, New York in 1980. She worked as a secretary in Manhattan. On March 22, 1980, Eve took a Long Island Railroad train home to Bay Shore. After leaving the train station, she still had to walk to get home. Sadly, she would never make it there. Three days later, her body was found. She had been strangled and assaulted. Investigators collected male DNA from her body that belonged to the person that took her life. It would take many years before investigators were able to use the DNA to identify a suspect, but recently, they did just that. They created a DNA profile of the suspect. Then that profile was submitted into public DNA databases. Finally, in 2022, investigators identified the son of the suspect. The son had entered his DNA onto a public genealogical website. Investigators went to interview the son, and he then gave them a DNA sample. After some more testing, investigators were convinced that Herbert Rice was the man they were looking for. The only problem was that he passed away in 1991 due to cancer. Rice was 29 years old at the time of the crime back in 1980. He lived with his mother near where Eve's body was found. Investigators then exhumed Rice's body and had a genetic analysis of his DNA confirmed that he was the one that took Eve's life. In late March of 2022, a press conference was held to announce the update in the case. Eve's sister, Irene Wilkowitz, had this to say at the press conference about seeing the face in a photo of the man who took her sister away. This is my first time seeing him. I didn't Google him even though I knew his name for a couple months now. I didn't want to see the last face that Eve saw when she was still alive. Prosecutors don't believe that Eve and Rice knew each other. They believe it was simply a crime of opportunity. Sixty-one-year-old Patricia Lorraine Barnes lived in Seattle, Washington in 1995. She was homeless and bounced between shelters in Seattle, and frequently stayed around the Pioneer Square area. Her friends in the homeless shelters referred to her as the Towel Lady because she often wore a towel or bandana around her head. On August 25, 1995, a passerby found a body in the ditch along Peacock Hill Road in Kitsap County, Washington. The body belonged to a white woman. She was found without clothing and was partially covered by a sleeping bag in the ditch. Her pink curlers were found near her body. She was quickly identified as Patricia Barnes. She had been fatally shot. About 130 individual evidence items were collected at the scene where her body was found. This included a cigarette found nearby, believed to have been used by the culprit and the sleeping bag. A witness came forward telling police that he last saw Patricia with a 30 to 35 year old white man. Patricia and the man planned to eat at Courthouse Park and then go to Federal Way. A sketch of the man was then drawn based on the witness's description, hoping that someone could identify him. Investigators believe that Robert Lee Yates could be responsible. 
He was involved in similar crimes in the area, but no link to him and Patricia could be found. He was in Alabama at the time of the crime. Unfortunately, no useful leads came and the case went cold for a few decades. That was until 2018. Detectives from the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office then decided to reopen the case. Investigators reviewed the evidence and photographs from the scene, re-interviewed detectives previously assigned to the case, and sent the physical evidence to Washington State Crime Lab, as well as two private forensic laboratories in Texas and Florida for DNA testing. In December 2021, one of those labs, Othram Inc. provided the name of the man whose DNA matched the DNA on the cigarette and the sleeping bag and a few other items. The man was Douglas Keith Crone. When investigators decided to question him, they realized that he passed away in 2016 due to accidental causes. On February 7, 2022, the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab confirmed that the DNA found at the crime scene belonged to him. Investigators tried to find out if Crone and Patricia knew each other, but haven't been able to do so. Crone had previous addresses in Seattle and Tacoma. He would have been 33 years old when the crime took place back in 1995. Crone has a criminal history in Washington State, including five felony convictions. One was a 1984 conviction for first-degree robbery. He was also arrested in 1994 in Pierce County on suspicion of second-degree kidnapping. Kitsap County Sheriff's Office Detective Mike Grant said, The linchpin in the case for me was that a cigarette butt was found at the body dump location with the same DNA as three items on or within the body. On August 7, 2009, a married couple was walking under a bridge near Lakeside Road in Greenville, South Carolina, looking for wildlife. They then stumbled upon a nude body of a woman in a creek. The woman was quickly identified as 24-year-old Allison Sutherland Crane, who was a Greenville native. An autopsy revealed that she had multiple blunt force trauma injuries. There was no DNA belonging to a possible suspect on her or at the crime scene. There was also no witnesses. Investigators located cell phone records that helped them make a connection between Allison and 38-year-old Jeffrey Phillips. Phillips was a frequent cab driver in the area and had driven Allison around before. Investigators were able to uncover that Phillips owed Allison money. Recently, investigators were able to locate more cell phone records where Phillips revealed he was the one that took Allison's life. Investigators also found that Phillips is currently incarcerated in Sullivan County Jail in Tennessee. He is awaiting trial for taking the life of his roommate back in 2017. His roommate was 28-year-old Timothy Franz. The two lived in a mobile home park in Tennessee. Phillips got angry with Timothy because Timothy sold methamphetamines to Phillips' girlfriend. Phillips tied Timothy's legs with a towel and then dragged him from the trailer. He then used a rock, garden hoe, and a sink pedestal to beat Timothy. The neighbors called the police. When they arrived at the crime scene, they found Timothy's body and Phillips exiting the trailer wearing only a bath towel. They let Phillips get dressed. When he reappeared, officers noted that there was blood on his shoes. When interviewed, Phillips kept changing his story. In one of the versions, he stated that he lured Timothy outside claiming he needed help assembling a hammock. Phillips allegedly said that he remembered punching Timothy in the face before he blacked out due to his anger and couldn't remember what happened. Back to Allison's case. Investigators have not stated specifically what was said in the cell phone records that led them being convinced Phillips is responsible for what happened to her. Phillips is now awaiting trial for both crimes. Greenville County Sheriff Hobart Lewis said, This is a prime example of the vision we had for the unit coming to life, to bring resolve and justice for the family and friends who tragically lost their loved ones. It is hard enough to lose someone you love, but having unanswered questions and their case go cold elevates the level of difficulty. I am so blessed to work alongside these dedicated investigators who work tirelessly in their pursuit of justice. We have so much more work to do, but this is another tremendous step in our agency's pursuit of unwavering commitment to solve cold cases. Lewis also said there were still about 90 cold cases in their county dating back to 1967 that they are still trying to solve. Allison's mother, Tammy Morrison, had this to say. Allison was loved by so many people. She was loved by her daughters, her sister, me, other family members, her uncle Stevie, and a lot of people that's not here that's passed on since this. Allison's sister, Ashley Simmons, also spoke to the media. 
We always said from day one that we would never give up on finding who took my sister away, and we never did. Thirty-nine-year-old Sherry Huss lived in Desert Hot Springs, California in 1994. She had moved there after divorcing her husband Jeff Huss, who lived in Cathedral City, California. They shared custody of their children, age 14, 13, and 8. By April 1994, Sherry was settling into her new life. It had been two months since she divorced Jeff. She found an apartment in the 12,900 block of Parma Drive. On the evening of April 23, 1994, Sherry sent a message to her parents. She told them that someone had been taking photos of her. She also received strange phone calls when the other person would hang up without saying anything. Sherry's parents decided to leave their San Fernando Valley home to check on their daughter. They got an ominous feeling when they arrived there. Sherry's porch light was on and her dog was outside. Her front door was unlocked and her car was parked on the street instead of the driveway. When the couple went inside, they found the unimaginable. Their daughter's partially clothed body was lying lifeless on the floor. She had multiple stab wounds and was also bitten by the person that took her life. Investigators were able to collect saliva from the culprit. It was evident that Sherry fought hard for her life and there was blood belonging to the suspect at the crime scene too. A DNA profile was created of the person who committed this crime and it was entered into the combined DNA index system. No matches could be made, unfortunately. Investigators tried to find the person who took the photos of Sherry and the person responsible for the strange telephone calls, but wasn't able to. Over the years, Sherry's parents worked hard to keep her case in the public eye, including the offer of a $50,000 reward. Every few years, investigators entered the DNA profile into the combined DNA index system, but there was never a match. Thus, the case went cold. Recently, with the advent of genetic genealogy, things quickly changed. In February of 2022, the Riverside Regional Cold Case Team was able to use the technology to identify a man as a potential person of interest. That man is 48-year-old Sharon Eugene Gadlin, who lives in Gardena, California. Back in 1994, when the crime took place, he was just 20 years old and lived in Thousand Palms, California, which was 12 miles away from Sherry's apartment. On February 14, 2022, cold case investigators obtained a saliva sample from Gadlin. Four days later on February 18th, investigators received confirmation from the State Department of Justice Lab that there was a DNA match of the saliva to the DNA profile of the person suspected of taking Sherry's life. He was arrested on March 4th, 2022, when officers pulled his vehicle over at an intersection in Gardena, California. Gadlin had previous run-ins with the police including a 1999 DUI arrest in San Bernardino County. He was also convicted that year of entering property without consent and public intoxication. It is not known yet if Gadlin and Sherry knew each other and why he did what he did. Riverside County District Attorney Mike Hestron said in a statement that he was hopeful the arrest meant Huss and her family would get the justice they deserve and had waited so long for. 28-year-old Mika Wadley lived in Richmond, California in 1999. One evening in January, a neighbor of Mika heard screaming coming from her home in the 1300 block of Carlson Boulevard. The neighbor went to her residence and knocked on the front door. The screaming continued for approximately 30 seconds. The neighbor then retreated to his apartment and called 911. Officers found the front door locked, but the back door was unlocked and partially opened. Once inside the home, investigators found Mika's body on the floor of her bedroom. Her hands were bound together with shoelaces. She had been smothered. A buck knife was located under her body. Investigators were able to find DNA and fingerprints belonging to the suspect at the crime scene. Their initial investigation focused on a man she spent the prior evening with. That person was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. There were no other investigative leads and the case went cold. In 2002, a mixed DNA profile was developed from swabs collected from Mika's hands and a bloodstain at the crime scene. This DNA profile was submitted to the California Department of Justice to search the offender database. Unfortunately, there were no matches. Then, in 2020, additional DNA testing was requested. This time they focused on the previously untested fingernail clippings and ligatures. 
A male DNA profile could be developed from Mika's fingernail clippings. In October of 2020, the DNA profile created by the Contra Costa County Crime Lab was submitted to the California Department of Justice DNA Data Bank program to conduct a familial search of the state DNA index system. Then, in April of 2021, California Department of Justice and Bureau of Forensic Services and Bureau of Investigation agents presented the results of the requested familial search. The Department of Justice's investigation revealed a person who was a potential first-degree relative of the male suspect, but the relative was ruled out as a suspect. Then finally, with the assistance of the Contra Costa County District's Attorney's Office, detectives were able to track down an immediate relative in September of 2021. A buckle swab was obtained from the person and submitted to the crime lab. On September 17, 2021, Richmond Police received notification that the buckle swab from the relative confirmed that Jerry Lee Henderson is the man whose DNA matched the fingernail clippings from Mika. Investigators discovered that Henderson passed away due to an overdose just 11 days after he took Mika's life. Nevertheless, Richmond Police hoped the revelation would provide some measure of closure for her relatives. California Attorney General Rob Bonta had this to say. Over the course of more than 20 years, law enforcement working this case never gave up. It is my sincere hope that this resolution brings the family of Mika Wadley a measure of peace. Nothing can ever bring back a loved one, but we're committed to doing all we can to help bring the truth to light in the fight for justice. Acting Richmond Police Chief Louis Tirona added, it is my hope that this news brings needed closure to all those who knew and loved Mika Wadley. Some of Mika's family members also spoke at the press conference. Answers might not come today, but it will come tomorrow. It's going to come, said Mika's sister Quila Wadley. My favorite auntie, she was beautiful, outgoing, and smart. Loved to hang out and have fun, said her niece Davine Peterson. Mika's family says Henderson was a friend of a friend but that there were no other relationship besides that. Fifteen-year-old Kenya McClinek and sixteen-year-old Kevin Drinks met in 1978 in Philadelphia. They were high school sweethearts. He took her to the senior prom at Germantown High, but they broke up shortly after graduation. Two decades later in the year 2000, Kenya and Kevin reconnected. Kenya's mom passed away and Kevin stopped by to pay his respects. They got married in 2001 in front of more than 100 people at the Unitarian Society of Germantown Church. Kevin serenaded Kenya while she walked down the aisle. He was a talented singer from a long line of vocalists in his family. In 2011, they bought their dream home in Ronhurst, Pennsylvania. Kevin found work at a furniture store in North Philadelphia as a delivery driver. Just a few months after buying the house, Kenya received a call from Kevin's youngest brother. He was frantically screaming and telling Kenya to get to the hospital. Kenya thought that Kevin might have been in a car accident and raced to Hahnemann Hospital. There, she learned that Kevin had been fatally shot behind the furniture store where he had just started working. It made no sense to Kenya. Kevin was a church-going grandfather who sang gospel music and loved spending time with his family. Who would want to take his life and why? Despite investigators' best efforts, they could not provide any answers to Kenya's questions. She passed out flyers and buttons and t-shirts calling for justice for Kevin Drinks in the area where the shooting occurred. She called her elected officials imploring them for help. Kenya also had to deal with rumors that Kevin was maybe involved with bad people. She also got frustrated seeing more and more cold cases solved while Kevin's remained open. Their dream home turned into a space of painful memories and also fear. As she did not know who targeted her husband, she wondered if she was safe. Kenya then moved. She prayed and pressed officials for answers and then prayed some more. Then finally, in 2018, she got news that she had been waiting for so long. Philadelphia Police Detective John Varecchio called her. He had been listening to recordings of jailhouse telephone conversations and heard something relevant to Kevin's case. Chad Runnels was accused of taking the life of a 22-year-old man two months before Kevin was shot. Chad was worried that a key witness was going to testify against him. He then plotted with three other men, Michael Blackston, Samaj Armstead, and Rashawn Combs. They wanted to silence the witness. Instead, they somehow shot Kevin Drinks, 
the wrong man. Kenya had wanted answers for so long, but when they finally came, they were gutting. In March of 2022, Runnels, Blackston, and Armstead were convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Combs' sentencing is scheduled for June of 2022. District Attorney Larry Krasner said he hopes this case shows Philadelphia that there are a lot of people in law enforcement who consider no case to be permanently cold and who are always trying. Kenya expressed her frustration about the case that went unsolved for so long, but she also praised what she called her dream team. It consists of Assistant District Attorneys Ashley Toxilowski and Christian Wynn, along with Witness Victim Coordinator Kathy Lees. Kenya was quoted as saying, People can say, oh, that's not really justice because he's not here. He's still gone. But my husband can rest in peace. That's how I look at it. 22-year-old Susan Amy Morse lived in Mesa, Arizona in 1989. She lived alone in an apartment near Country Club Drive and Southern Avenue in Mesa. On October 16, 1989, Susan's body was found in her apartment. She had been assaulted and strangled. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the suspect from her body. They also interviewed residents of the apartment building. Some residents said they saw Susan the previous day. This helped investigators to create a timeline. A year later, in November 1990, another crime took place in that apartment building. A 23-year-old woman was assaulted. The man stole her money and a VCR, but fortunately, she survived the attack. Investigators collected DNA from her too, and was able to confirm that it was the same man that was responsible for both crimes. Unfortunately, as DNA was not advanced enough, investigators could not identify the man and the case went cold. Recently, however, with the help of genetic genealogy, investigators could use the DNA collected back in 1989 and 1990 to identify the man. He is 58-year-old Thomas Cox. Cox was arrested in Colorado Springs on April 26, 2022, by the FBI and officers from the Mesa Police Department. He has already been taken to jail in Arizona. The Mesa Police Department is hoping this will bring some answers and closure for the two separate cases and their families. Mesa Police Department Sergeant Chuck Trapini had this to say, Ms. Moores, she doesn't have any family that we know of. Her parents have passed away, but we do have the second victim which is the victim of the assault. She is still alive, and from what the detective told me, she is so happy that we caught the suspect. Of course, after his arrest, we were able to analyze his fingerprints, the fingerprints at the scene, and we got a hit there as well. So it was a great collaboration between the FBI and the county's attorney's office and the Mesa PD. We can't give enough credit to the detectives that worked this case. We just constantly look for stuff, when there's new technology or new techniques on how to identify a suspect or examine evidence, we buy into that and we re-examine the evidence as the years go on and in this particular case, it worked out dramatically. Cox is being held on a $1 million cash bond only. His next court hearing will be on April 29, 2022. Investigators do not believe that Cox knew either of the two victims, but did note that his mother lived right next door to Susan. Thirty-seven-year-old Lisa Fracassi lived in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1994. She worked as an exotic dancer. Her plan was to save up money to go to nursing school. Lisa was last seen alive during the early morning hours on Halloween of 1994. Then a few days later, on November 3rd, her body was found in her apartment. She had been strangled. Officers from the Honolulu Police Department collected DNA from the crime scene that belonged to the person that took her life. They had just started using a reliable DNA storage method to avoid any contamination that year. In 2020, police gave DNA and fingerprints from the crime scene to the Parabon Nano Labs, a Virginia-based company that specializes in providing phenotyping services to law enforcement agencies. As many of you will know, the company has been instrumental in creating profiles that have helped police departments and prosecutors across the U.S. solve cold cases in recent years. Making use of genetic genealogy, they identified Cecil H. Trent as the person responsible for what happened to Lisa. He was 29 years old in 1994 when the crime took place. He lived in Honolulu at the time. 
He passed away in 2013 at the age of 48 due to a congestive heart failure. After he passed, his fingerprints were taken. One of his family members uploaded their DNA to a public DNA site called GED Match. This is how he was linked to the crime. Lisa's friend, America St. Thomas, had this to say. She was a caring person, like a nurse who would sit for hours with people who needed help. She wanted to be a nurse and started dancing so she could save up money to go to school, but with a regular job, it's difficult to go to nursing school. Once you get involved in nightlife, it's even harder. Hawaii Pacific University professor Cheryl Sunia used to be a Honolulu Police Department detective working on Lisa's case. This is what she had to say. It's a wonderful feeling to be able to tell the families you're going to get closure. We know what happened. We know who did this. Local police in Honolulu are currently working on a backlog of cases. In 2018, they launched the Never Forgotten Project in order to deal with numerous unsolved cases. Twenty-seven-year-old Emma Caldwell lived in Glasgow, Scotland in 2005. She was a sex worker in Glasgow's Red Light District. Emma was last seen on April 4, 2005. Five weeks later, her body was found 40 miles away in woods near South Larnakshire. Investigators collected forensic evidence at the crime scene. They interviewed potential suspects, but no real leads were forthcoming and the case went cold. In 2015, the case was reopened following consideration by senior lawyers in the Crown Office and campaigning by Emma's mother, Margaret. Finally, in February of 2022, a man was arrested in connection to the case. He is 49-year-old Ian Parker. Senior investigating officer Graham Mackey said, Police Scotland officers have undertaken a significant amount of work reinvestigating all circumstances surrounding Emma's case, following instruction from the Lord Advocate. He added, This is a complex and challenging investigation, and I would like to thank everyone involved for their efforts in getting us to this point of a man being arrested earlier today. Emma's family, in particular her mother Margaret, have shown incredible resilience and determination, and I would like to pay tribute to that today. We have remained in close contact with them during the investigation, and officers have updated Margaret on this significant development. Solicitor Amor Anwar read out a statement on behalf of Emma as he sat beside her mother Margaret at a media briefing following the arrest. He said that Margaret and her family were truly grateful to the detectives at Police Scotland and the Lord Advocate Dorothy Bain's team, who have worked tirelessly in reinvestigating the case of Emma. He added, I also wish to pay tribute to Margaret Caldwell, a mother who through the love of a child has never given up in her struggle for justice. The investigation continues and her family would urge anyone with information, no matter how insignificant they might think it is, to please come forward and speak with Police Scotland. 